All right, guys, welcome back to the Rich Shields Golf Show podcast, episode 190, closing in on that 200 mark. Yes. If we're going to do something live, we've got to start planning it pretty soon. You've, no, we'd, you, we can't, if we're going to, you've committed to this. You said we definitely, definitely, definitely are. And you said you'll get me a little trophy as well for 200 episodes. So I'm looking forward to that. A little mini claret jug. So we'll do our best. More information on potentially a live show coming soon. This episode. Yes. I think if people saw the title, they might go, ooh, this might be a very interesting one. We had a guest on. Yes. Last week, we were down at Woburn in Watford, kind of North London, and it's the home of Ian Poulter. Correct. Previous PGA Tour player, DP mm. World Tour player, current live player. Yes. Captain of the Majestics. Mm-hmm. He is our first live player that we've had as a guest on the show. Correct. Um, This is a really, really interesting interview. I found it fascinating. Now, just to give everybody a bit of an insight, we dive into a lot. (laughs) Yes. It starts fairly kind of smoothly. And we, we, you know, Ian is someone for me growing up playing golf. He was a huge inspiration from someone like myself because his backstory of becoming a PGA professional or becoming a a tour pro was the fact he used to be an assistant pro like me, like lots of other assistant pros. He did his PGA qualification like me Mm -hmm. at the Belfry. And so I always kind of, you know, always looked up to him to someone who's like, wow, he's, he's taken it from probably admit it himself a fairly average player growing up, he's become a multiple tour winner. Well, that's very interesting. A lot of people, or, or, or well, a lot of people do know, many might not, that Ian Poulter famously turned pro of a four handicap, which is not uncommon if you wanted to go into the world of coaching or you want to become a club pro or whatever it might be. YouTuber. Yes. But to be, to turn pro of a four handicap and go on to even get on tour, never mind get on tour, retain a tour card, never mind retain a tour card, win European tour events, PGA tour events is absolutely unheard of. However, in this podcast, we do ask him about that. And there's a bit more to the story yes. of why he turned pro off four than people may think. We also talked about his, his new life on tour, mm. on live tour and what that means to him. The positives and I quizzed him, grilled him on the negatives as well. Well, that's something, again, many listeners, viewers of the podcast, certainly if you're a Clubhouse member or you've listened to a lot of the podcast, will know we've had very um, open opinions on Live Golf, some of its pros, lots of its cons, etc. We've both kind of openly admitted we're not massive fans of it. Um, we spoke about it. He gave reasons why he joined and, and why he likes it. And much more honest reasons, I think, that Correct. we've ever heard from 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 him. It's the most honest I've heard him say why he joined Liv. And I'm sure a lot of you people listening will guess why he joined. But yes. it was nice to hear it from his own mouth. Um, but yeah, he, he was really honest. He, he was really um, great with his time. We also had the privilege of going out and playing an 18 hole match with him, a 10 shot challenge where I start 10 on the pie. He starts level mm. that will also be coming out soon. Not this week, maybe next week. We also dived into Ryder cup. We did. And his legacy. I mean, he is from the Europe standpoint, a Ryder cup legend. Yeah. I think that's why, you know, you wouldn't be too far off. I think if you said in the UK that Ian Poulter is up there with a household as a household name, certainly just among, general sports fans. I'd find it very hard to believe you'd find, you know, if you've got 10 lads who like going watching football, out of those 10 lads who might not even play golf at all, seven, eight would know who Ian Poulter is because a lot of people have interest in the Ryder Cup and he's been such a figure of that. Um, but what was also quite interesting actually about this before we get into the podcast, which as we said, is a banger. On the way down to um, Woburn, I took Alex who, who works with us and he said to me, oh, who, who's a tour pro that you've met? that surprised you, that was different to what you thought they were going to be like in a positive or a negative way. And I kind of scratched my head a little bit and thought, you know what? Most tour pros have kind of been what I expected. Adam Scott stands out as a guy who was even nicer than you could have ever dreamed of, wasn't he? Oh, he was, just he the was ridiculous. Man, the perfect man. Um, Lee Westwood was kind of how I thought he'd be. Lovely guy, quite dry, likes his banter. Kind of what you'd yeah. expect. 
we'd briefly, or I'd, I'd met Ian Poulter once before, very briefly with you, ironically at Woburn, for a few minutes chat, and he came across nice. I don't know if you've met him much before or... I think I've met him once or twice. Um, one of the times I met him, he was actually playing with our friend James Robinson in uh, the Open oh, practice yes. round. Yes. And I remember just chatting to him very briefly then, but, but not a great deal of dialogue with him. It's been... A few interactions on social media, but not not much. And before you come to your point, I know what you're going to come on to in a minute. I just want to make this super, 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 super clear. This was all done through me just DMing Correct. Ian. Like this was not a staged or um, there was no, what's the right word? There was no um, affiliation to any tour to no. make this actual event happen. We were down at Woburn and they have their Titleist Performance Centre there. They're bringing out some new irons. I was going for an iron fitting. I thought, you know what? I know Ian's in the UK at the moment. I literally DM'd him saying, hey Ian, are you around? He said, yeah. I said, do you fancy filming? He said, let's do it. And you missed out a bit there though. I then sent some nice email to get it over the line. Well, obviously. But <laughs> I'm it, joking. It started. No, completely. You slid I, into his DMs. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't anything to do with any tours. It was just an opportunity. Absolutely. I thought, let's give it a go. But, but going back Come to your so. point about... So yeah, so what these pros are like. So what I went down, I'll be totally honest now, and I'm sure Ian's team have listened to this. I went down thinking that um, Ian would be a nice guy. I thought he would want to be there because obviously he'd agreed to it, like you said, just off his own back. But I kind of wondered, like, will there be, as you sometimes get with these guys, will there be a bit of a look at the watch every now and again? How long is this going to be? Or whatever it might You know, I wasn't fully sure what to expect. He's, he's a successful guy who's been on tour for 20 odd years. You know, I couldn't quite... I didn't have a real expectation of what I was going to get. And honest to God now, I will go down forever now saying he was one of the nicest tour pros I've met. He I was think, such a family yeah. guy. He had his two sons with him, Luke and Josh, who, let's be honest, are a credit to him. Really nice, but nice lads, very well behaved. Uh, I say well behaved. Uh, how old's Luke's like 18, 19? Yeah, Luke is going to be a baller. Yeah, he, very, he is really tall and looks like he's grinding like crazy. Josh is his youngest son, who's probably about... I think he's 11. He, he, he's like an excitable puppy. That's exactly what I was going to say. He is like an excitable puppy. Bless him. He was desperate to be on shoot. He was desperate. He sat in on the podcast. He actually features a little bit yeah. on the podcast. Um, we also have a surprise appearance from the chef at Woburn on this yes. podcast. After you got me. your wrist slapped. Sl slandering their sausage rolls last time. Yeah. They wanted to make an amends and I'm, and I'm glad. So that comes up, up on this podcast as well. But yeah, Ian was, he was, he was really, really nice. Yeah. No, I yeah, hundred percent agree. Um, I think the podcast you'll enjoy a lot to listen to a lot of little nuggets in there to take away and the match, honestly, and this isn't just trying to big it up too much. Your match against Ian Poulter he starts level par, you start 10 under par, round Woburn, round the Duke's course. His home course. His home course. Was, mm, in fact, I'm going to say it now, I think it was the best match you've had. Wow. I'm going to say that right now on camera. So stay tuned for that. But before that gets released next week, sit back. And if you're not the biggest Ian Fulter fan in the world, give this podcast a listen to. Mm. Not saying it will change your mind, but it definitely... A different side of him that I'd never seen before. And I think a lot of people listening and watching are going to really, really enjoy. And if you are the biggest Ian Pult fan in the world, you're equally going to love it. Love and it. And if you're somewhere in between, you're going to love it. So I think everyone's going to love this podcast. <laughs> everyone in the world is going to love this podcast. And if you do love this podcast, please do feel free to like the YouTube video, share it with some friends, but also on Apple or Spotify, rate the podcast. And again, share it with a few friends who might only occasionally dip into podcasts. Push it towards them forced them to listen to it. Let's spread the word, right? Sit back, enjoy this very candid podcast with Ian Poulter. So Ian, thank you for joining us. Absolute pleasure. Uh, to be honest, I feel like we're joining you because we're down mm -hmm. here at your home golf course today here in the UK. In the Poulter room. In the, <laughs> in the actual Ian Poulter room. This is very, cool, isn't it? Very nice. Yes, yeah, it's a great room. Got some memorabilia on the walls. I think we need to add a few more, to be honest. So Angus needs to uh, give uh, Woburn some additions to that. I think we need some majestic shirts and some bits and pieces in there. It is though. And, and to be honest, it's quite handy because just to the left here, we've got your career highlights too. Oh, so if perfect. we forget anything. Yeah, they're still on a little small glass plaque. <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a lot on there though. My glass plaque. <laughs> it definitely is. You know, you know what? I, I want to dive into loads of things today. But one of the really interesting topics, obviously we live in the world of social media. Mm. 
you were one of the first to the party mm. of golf pros into social media. Actually, look, today it was like 2009, April 2009, you joined Twitter. Where did, that, where did that come about? I, 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 don't, I don't rightly know exactly where I was, but I think there was a... There was somebody else on tour that I saw had a social media page and was putting some reasonable content out. Now, I take tons of pictures, have been fairly vocal through my time. <laughs> so I thought this would be a, like a really cool avenue to, to kind of give people an insight into what we do day in, day out. Because, you know, as, as what is the world of, of today is different to what it was 14 years ago. And um, more content, more cameras, more pictures, like people eat videos, media content. That's why you guys yeah, are here, right? Exactly. Because it's, it, it's what everyone wants. Yeah. So I kind of felt that that, that was a good opportunity, um, especially, you know, playing some great golf around that time as well, kind of 2009, 10, 11, 12, to be able to push some cool content mm. to people. Did it also feel like it gave you a platform to actually vocalize what you're thinking and actually, you know, be able to tell the truth, whether there was any media that you felt like you needed to rectify. Did it, did it give you a platform? You can go, right. You know what? If you want to know the in true information, this is what I think. Yeah. Fu funny. I mean, funny you say that, but there, there was a time, there was a quote in a magazine, which really, um, it, and it pops up from time to time. You, you probably know exactly what, what it was, but, um, you know, I, I was taken a little out of context in what I was actually saying mm -hmm. and what I actually said. And obviously, like all good media outlets, right, there's, um, there's, always, there's always a way to shorten something or, or, or take a piece of that. Um, and, you know, social media gives you that opportunity to, to actually correct it. It's never normally going to get, get corrected mm -hmm. in the media, so you might as well be able to push it out yourself. So that was a decent opportunity and a, and, and a place where I feel, you know, you could write a few wrongs in, in those certain terms and hopefully get your, your honest opinion across. I think, I think that's something though, that I as a golf fan like to see that we see these great golfers like yourself, you know, on tour, winning events, playing the PJ tour, but to see golfers who actually actively use social media, it does help to, to grow a deeper fan base because you feel like you get to know that person more and hearing their opinions and their take on things and their humour, etc. I think it definitely helps to build a real fan base. And I saw at the Open this year, actually, uh, well, last year now, at the old course, the amount of people on one of the practice days that were chasing yourself for pictures and stuff, it was noticeable that you've obviously really built a hardcore following. Do you think social media has helped with that as such? Yeah, I... You know, I've, I think I've done a decent job mm. in, in the following that we've had, um, you know, to build a, a core audience, I would say. People that I can relate to, people that, that follow me for not just my golf, mm -hmm. but other, other general family interests, what we're obviously into off the golf course, you know, stuff that I like to push, push out to people. And, you know, too many pages, in my opinion, um, are just done by other people. Yeah. Now, I can't do every single post. Now, Angus, who, who helps to do our social media, um, does all the video editing and all the cool stuff that I simply can't do. Um, and obviously that could get, you know, pushed out at times, you know, on our page. But, you know, 90% of the stuff that I do, whether it's pre-warming up or practicing that I push out, I'm pushing it out myself. So... There are too many people, in my opinion, that don't give the real look mm -hmm. from themselves. They don't yeah. even look at social media, yeah. which, which, you know, I, I don't get that side of it. But, but for me to have an audience that I relate to, um, I don't respond to every message because it's just simply impossible. Much, There's just yeah. hundreds. You'll have exactly oh, yeah, the same. Exactly. Some people get offended when you don't respond, but there's just nothing you can do. But, you know, um, I also think people appreciate when you do get opportunity to respond. Yes. So, you know, if you responded to everybody, it doesn't maybe one, it's impossible to do. And also it wouldn't feel quite as special mm. where when you do get an opportunity to say thank you to someone or like a tweet, it carries a lot of weight mm. and you can tell your social media is done by you. You know, certainly your Instagram stories, it's obvious you holding the phone, yeah. <laughs> you talking, you know, it's yeah. all of those nice touches that I think you write more 
people with social media should try and do, you know, it's not, I think a lot of players maybe got into social media because of other aspects where you can really see your social media kind of passion, really. I think a lot of it's just to keep sponsors happy and it's very corporate and it's not really showing you the inside their life. And like you said, that I think, and we've seen it, we'll come on to, I'm sure, like the Netflix documentary, seeing behind, you know, what's really people's lives are like, it definitely helps me anyway become more attached to golfers and root for them and want them to win because I feel like I know them a bit more. Currently back in the UK, do you miss home soil? Is it nice to get back home, taste some nice bacon? I know you love a bit of English bacon and HP. What, <laughs> what, what do you what do you miss most about? Listen, I'm, I'm I'm on a I'm on somewhat of a fitness kind of. Oh, um, is that the wrong thing to say to you I'm, at the moment? I'm trying really hard because I've lost about twenty pound in weight, which um, mm-hmm. needed to go. Very I was good. way too heavy last August coming back from the UK. Yeah. Um, spent a little bit of time at Woburn eating, you know, all sorts of great home foods and, you know, it got me definitely, um, way above my weight of where I wanted to be. Vice team weight. 206 pounds, which is, um, which is heavy. So, uh, I've shed all of that decent weight. I added some last week in Italy on a family (laughs) holiday, but I'm now back in, in shed mode. Um, but you know, I, I miss home comfort food. Mm stuff that I grew up on, you know, eating curries and Chinese and the occasional fish and chips and sausage sandwich and bacon sandwich and all of that stuff. I mean, it's just, there's, there's nothing like it when, when you're home and in and around home, it's, you know, you can't beat a yeah. you know, packet of pickled onion monster munch. <laughs> is that you? Is that you? No, but they're in the cupboard, so you just got to have that. You, you just have to have a pack, don't you? I mean, like there's a little jar on the side that Katie always keeps full of the you know, they're just, just small chocolates and there's dairy milks and fudge and whispers and all of that. You know, you walk past and you've got to put your hand in the little cookie jar you and you have, a, <laughs> you do. have a bit of chocolate. Can you get most of the stuff in the, in the US? Actually, there is a there is a website for that. All oh, right. Yeah, there is a, it's called EnglishShop.com, I think it is. Um, and you can get anything oh. and it's delivered within a week. And occasionally I'll go home and... It's delivery time and this humongous <laughs> box of Cadbury's and Walker's Chris. I mean, you name it, it's yeah. in there. I mean, you know, jars of um, jars of pickle and like it's, you know. The best. It's it's like a little touch of touch of UK heavens arrived on the doorstep. <laughs> it's amazing. And what about the family? Obviously, they've spent most of the time, certainly the kids in the US. Do they still love the little English treats? Have you managed to get get the get the boys on on the english you've got josh there nodding, nodding. in the background oh look he like we we have a snack cupboard like we do in america in, in but back home here and you know he eats probably half of his dinner <laughs> and then the rest of the night he's just straight in you know what we'd say is like a little tuck shop in 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 the kitchen and it's hula hoops and <sighs> he loves he loves a pack of hula hoops <laughs> who doesn't i mean <laughs> so yeah i mean they just you know um you know, eat, eating, eat, I mean, it's a summer, summer of sugar. And it's quite funny when we always come back, back to America and they go and see the doctor and just for a checkup and they jump on the scales and like, you can see this like <laughs> blip of the, of the weight increase once, once, once they've come back to the UK. So, um, see, I go the other way. It's when I go to the U S yes. I, I found there's way too much temptation out in the U S I, I find it to so, eat. yeah, I'm, I'm exact opposite. Really? Oh my goodness. Obviously. I find it impossible to Burgers. eat well in yeah. America. But maybe because it's quite novel and you think, well, I've got to try a fl- uh, Chick-fil-A or I've got yes. to go to, oh, you know. Chick- Chick-fil-A's good. Um, Cheesecake Factory. Oh no, can't stand it. The, the, portions, the portions are, are for astronomical. They're for four people. That's what. They're astronomical. Oh, so I shouldn't have had two. <laughs> two, two portions They're absolutely astronomical well, having said that if you lived in the states in the warm and that heat would you not be more motivated to get up to go for a run to train to eat a bit healthier if you live by the beach potentially you got to get the beach body out every yeah, now and exactly. again potentially you know what I was going to come on to this later but I think it's a nice point now you know what I really love seeing on social media with yourself and certainly my, I'm a family man guys recently had a, a little uh, girl as well just over Christmas time how amazing you are with your family on social mm. media like it's, it's really nice to see. It's certainly things that when we did watch the Netflix documentary, my wife watched it with you, watched it with me, sorry. And, and your episode, she was like blown away how lovely of a family man you were. And it's so evident to see like Joshua's here, Luke's here. Um, 
they're, they're, they're obviously to some degree following you. Because they want to hang out with you. They don't <laughs> want to hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> they, they obviously seem super keen to be following your footsteps as well. I mean, Luke looks like an incredible golfer at the moment. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I've always wanted to be um, in and around my family at all times. And, you know, being on the road for 28 to 30 weeks a year for the last 25 years um, has not been easy. And I think, you know, the, the guilt that you have sometimes when you're on an aeroplane, you haven't played very well, um, you're traveling, you know, hours and hours and hours to get to get back home. There's something about family which kind of brings it all back um, that, you know, missing birthdays, missing nativity plays, missing competitions, missing kind of big milestones mm. in their kind of upbringing, which, which you're never going to be able to, to, to get those memories back. Um, you know, it means that I want to spend as much time with them as I possibly can. So I'm a, a bit close shop as a, as a, as a, as a housey guy who wants to be at home and be, be in and around them, um, as much as I possibly can, because, you know, Amy's 21. Um, she's obviously at college, Luke's at college at university of Florida, Albeit he's two hours away and he pops back at weekends to get some of his laundry done sometimes. <laughs> of course he does. Because mum's too good at it, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, bef before we know it, those two are going to be out of the house. Mm. They're going to be doing their own thing. They're going to be working. Either Luke's going to be playing golf. Amy's going to be on to a, to a job somewhere and she's, she's going to have her own life. So, you know, I've kind of, this game of golf has passed me by already so quickly in 25 years that I've kind of missed too much of their time. Mm. So because I can't get any of that back, I just want to keep as much time as I possibly can within reason with, with them. Um, and that's, that's why I, I treat family time very, very special time. Uh, family holidays last, like last week was, was amazing for me. Um, just to, you know, to really enjoy them and seeing them have a good time and help them in their journey of what, whatever it is they're going to do. Do you feel the last two years since joining Live has helped you free up weeks and days to spend more time with family? So I'm guessing that was part of a lot of players' motives was to get more time back, spend a bit more time at fam with family. Have you found that over the last two years? Yeah, we, we you know, we're, we're in a summer schedule right now, which I don't believe I've had nine weeks in the UK and only have a commitment to play two weeks. So seven weeks off in the UK will be the longest time I've ever had in 25 years in the UK to enjoy family, friends, proper holiday time, bit of downtime, gym work, practice like this, you know, this, this opportunity with this summer, summer schedule, um, has been refreshing to be yeah. honest. Um, you know, when I look back to, you know, on the board behind, behind guy there, 1999 and we're, you know, we're, with 2023. So all of a sudden, so, you know, that whole, I look at that, you know, all of those events that I've played in, in all of those years, and there's not much windows where we get an opportunity to have a bit of a, a refreshing break. So, you know, that's the beauty I think for us for live is having a 14 week schedule, which we know exactly where we're going to play. We know exactly what day we're traveling out. We know exactly what day we're obviously coming home mm -hmm. and you can pre-plan pre-book. Yeah team travel, um, and give us the opportunity to have these breaks and windows, which are, I think, good mentally, um, you know, to be able to have those, those downtime windows to really refresh, recharge, get some other family, good quality family time in yeah. to be able to come out, you know, fit, strong, ready See, to go. That's <laughs> interesting you say that though, because like, obviously when people look at yourself, and, you know, many, many elite tour professionals are living our dream because we all listen to this podcast and watching this podcast play golf and want to, would love to have a living playing golf at these amazing golf courses for amazing prize money. But equally, like you've said there, you've obviously had to sacrifice missing out a lot of things with your children. And it must feel like sometimes it is a price to pay. And, and then having that more time now at home must feel kind of invaluable, really. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it, it's priceless. And I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say... we you know, we haven't done well mm -hmm. for ourselves in, in the way I've provided for the kids. So look, you know, I've earned, I've earned a lot of money in my career. Um, it goes without saying, and to be able to, for me to provide for them 
in a way that, you know, 25 years ago, thinking back that I, I could be in this position um, would, would be a fairy tale. Yeah. So there are sacrifices that you have to make in doing that um, to be able to spend that time away from home. So for the guilt that you have for being away and missing, you know, lot, lots of milestones, obviously you want to be rewarded as much as you can and, and, and obviously, you know, go home and provide for your family the best way you possibly can. So, you know, I, I, I don't feel guilty about, you know, being able to go and compete for, for large quantities of money because, you know, we've trained hard, we've worked hard in, you know, in, in 25 years of, of yeah. training to go and, to go and play to, to provide for what really matters the most to me. And that is, that is family. So, you know, if I had to give it all up today to spend more time with the family, that's that would be something that I could definitely consider doing mm. because the family mean more to me than any job or any sport of course. or anything. Well, one quick question I had, and I hope you don't mind me asking this then, but you know, look at that board there. Your first win was 1999, and obviously today it's 2023. You're still, you know, the top level of professional golf. And I think your story, which I'm sure we'll come on to, I'm kind of jumping ahead a bit, is something that a lot of people will know. You turn pro off four handicap, you were like working at a golf club. And some- Wait, which, by the way, just done that. What, was you actually a four handicap? But were, yeah. you, but were you actually playing to a four handicap or were you not much better? Wikipedia might tell a lie, but it says that you didn't play comps because the pro you're working for made you pay a green fee. Is that true or false? Well, there's lots of kids watching, so I can't say what he actually really was. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, my boss wasn't very nice at the time. So I, I, I stopped playing golf competitively. Not that I really played any much competitive golf even before then, but basically the age of 17. Mm. Um, and you know, my, my, my boss made it difficult to have time off right. to go and play in competitions. I didn't play in, in medal competitions basically because it was expensive. I had to pay a green fee to go and play and enter, enter a medal. So I didn't, I stopped doing that. So my handicap at the age of 17 was four. But what do you reckon you, what, what do you think it was? Well, I don't, look, I, you must've been plus, plus two, plus three, plus four. My, in old, in the, old lowest, handicap money. the lowest handicap I got to was four. However, I practiced my backside off. I was on the range before work, after work, um, during lunch times. I'd have a quick sandwich, go straight out and hit a bucket of balls. Didn't charge you for balls? No, that was the one thing that was free. So that's what I hit <laughs> a lot of. I hit a lot of balls. Um, You're like, I'll show him. But I'll I, hit more balls. But I used to, like, you know, for instance, you know, Mark Litton, who's a, you know, he's a European tour chief referee today. He was played on the European tour for a couple of years. I, he was at my club and I used to drive him to the airport to, to get him to go away and he'd give me a dozen golf balls. Right. So that was a little bit of, you know, how I got yeah. my golf balls to play golf from the age of 17. Um, but which he got for free, by the way, but um, he'll hate me for saying that. So, uh, I paid, ball, what balls did it back in? Was it Torbalata? They were, were Titanus, yeah, Torbalata. So, yeah, I, I paid for my fuel. I drove him to the airport and he gave me a free dozen golf balls. Brilliant. That, that's how Rick pays us. We don't get paid. <laughs> I get paid Pro V1s. Pro V1s? I thought they were still, still tour professionals. Um, but just, just on that, though, this, this leads me perfectly, actually, into what I was going to ask you originally that you've got this kind of quite uh, humble background and hard work and dedication, like you just said, then hitting ball after ball after ball to get to where you've got to. And I think there's, there's, there's not many tour pros can get to that level without grit, determination, hard work. Your son, Luke, obviously, as you said, he's currently at university, at college, uh, um, golfing. And then obviously, from what I've seen on social media, he's, he's doing very well and excelling at that. How have you balanced parenthood then in the sense that you kind of, I don't want to say came from nothing, but worked to where you get into? And obviously, the position you're in now, you can provide for your children, which obviously most parents would love to do. How has he got that work ethic as well. And has he really worked hard himself? Does that come from you? Have you taught him that? Because you could look at it and say, everything's on a plate for him. But the way he's performing at his golf, he must be grinding. He is grinding. He works hard. He And, and the, the nice thing for, he's not in the room, but I mean, the nice thing for me with Luke is that he wants to be himself. Mm. And look, it's going to be difficult. He's always kind of going to be Ian's son in a way, which is which is difficult. So the advantages that that has is also disadvantages as well. And, you know, the disadvantage for him is the fact that he knows he's going to have to work harder 
to be able to get out of that shadow situation to become his own individual. So I'm, I'm proud the way his work ethic is. I'm proud how he, when he puts his mind to stuff, he's capable of doing really good things. Um, you know, to get a position at university of Florida is not easy. He got accepted in as someone that didn't play tons of, you know, tournaments leading in. I mean, today's kids just seem to play tournaments every single weekend mm. of the entire year. Luke didn't really do that. So the coach saw, saw a level of talent that he had and wanted to bring him into the team. He didn't play officially on the team last year. It was a very senior team and they won the NCAA championships, which was, wow. which was pretty cool. But you know, he, he's going to be in a position coming up in, in a few months time where he's going to be fighting to get himself in, into that team. Um, which is good because it's pushing him. Yeah. He knows he's been on the outside. He's seen the success that the team have had this year and it's, you know, it's really making him hungry. So he's committed. He works hard in the gym. He's actually got a six pack. So I need to he's actually good, shed yeah. a bit more, shed a little bit more now <laughs> so I can actually uncover mine if there's actually one under there. Um, but he's self-driving me too. So I think I've driven him. Well, you set, you set by example, you lead by example. Like he's, he'll be seeing the hours and the hard work that you put in at the driving range, in the gym, on the short game area, on the putting green. He knows what it'll take, won't he? I well, suppose that's as well. to Luke as well, though, because I guess if you were, if your dad was Ian Poulter, you could almost go, oh, okay, I don't really need to, to work that hard. I'll, I don't know. I feel like he must see what you've instilled in him and feel motivated, and he has to because... Like you said, although your your name, his name helped to some degree, that's not going to get him on the team. He has to be the golf he's got to be to get that shirt and get on that team. So fingers crossed this year he gets on that team and, and the team wants to win again. It'd be awesome. That'd be amazing. I mean, I you know, he he's in a he's in a wonderful college. You know, Coach Deacon is an incredible coach and obviously proven that this year with with the rest of the team. Um but yeah, I mean it's 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 that extra piece that he needs to find which is going to make the big difference. I mean, he went out and shot 11 under on the Dukes the other day. So 11 um, under. And then he, and then the simple <sighs> fact of he goes out to qualify and he didn't qualify for the, for the amateur. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's finding a way to pull it together. So he's, he's got the game. He's got everything it takes to go and compete at a very high level. I know because I've seen him hit it. Is he, is he beating you yet? And, He's never officially, but we don't actually play that much in terms of full rounds of golf as a full. Does he always want to play your stroke play as opposed to match play? No, no, he's stroke play. No, no, he's <laughs> stroke play. No, no, he's um, match play. So, you know, I, I, I give him these small windows of opportunity when we do occasionally play to, to take me on. And I mean, he shot the same score as me three times, but he hasn't kind of got over the line. So it's about, it's about understanding how to, to piece it together at the right time. It's great going to shoot yeah. 11 under casually yeah. um, because not many people have ever <laughs> probably been in that position. So I know how talented he is. It's about him finding what makes him do that when he, when he has to do it and when he needs to do it. Yeah. And, um, it will be exciting to help him try and find that from within because, you know, there are so many great golfers in the world that I've, I've played with in 25 years and that are capable to go and shoot 11 under par. There are not many people that are capable of doing that under tournament conditions. It, it's funny you say that because we've had a luxury and obviously today's going to be an amazing video where Rick takes you on around Woburn. I will not be shooting 11 under par today, by the way. <laughs> I'm starting 10 under par yeah, and I still won't be yeah. shooting 11 under par. <laughs> but, but we film some amazing athletes and we've watched like Minwoo Lee up close, Adam Scott, who hit the ball so well. Sam Horsfield. Sam Horsfield. Who's obviously a majestic, has been on the channel. Flusher. Yeah, correct. But we've also filmed some kind of much, much lesser known tour pros or guys who actually had to leave the tour because they've not made it. And we've watched them up close and honestly scratching our heads as to how on earth are you not on the European tour winning week in, week, week out. But it's like you said, it's one thing doing it, even on a video, a fairly easy course, quite chilled. The pressures of doing that for your mortgage, 72 holes, week in, week out, it must be different. That's what switches me on. Mm. Casual golf doesn't. So I could go and shoot 80 today, but, you know, ca casual golf for me is... Um, it's, it's a social piece mm. for me. It's not actually any form of practice. Like I do all my practice as a visualization on the driving range. When I go and play golf casually, I don't generally play golf casually. Very so, rarely do I actually play around a golf. So in like a practice round, how do you stay motivated? 
Um, I have like little side hustles I or struggle. anything. Really? I really, really, really struggle, yeah. Even if it was a side hustle with like Westwood or Stenson or well, we, we 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 have a bit of a game going at the minute. So it's the two oldies versus generally the two young ones. Um, and Westy and I have, have fended them off every single time no so far. Way. And that's a lot of matches. But again, that is a piece of, you know, that that's fun to me because it's, that's that's almost like a semi pride match. Yes, right. I mean, it's a hundred bucks, but um, it's not the hundred bucks. It's the winning. It's it's the actual fact of, of it being, you know, Bra- be, bragging be, rights beating the other guys. So if if you were here today and Sam Horsfield turns up and he gra- gets you and says, "Ian, I'm going to beat you today. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to destroy you." Is that what gets you going? That right? I'll show yeah, it's you. A fun, you know. I mean, that that would be. That I mean, you, you needs to give me a bit, a bit more notice just to make sure I'm, 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 I'm ready for it. Right? <laughs> but it's a case. It for me, for me, life's a what life's one massive game. It's been a massive game from from my whole childhood. Sport has been everything about me in in the way I grew up. So everything has to be a part of competition, and I want to win every single competition I play. Mm-hmm. So every, during all of my days, I want to do everything I possibly can to to win at everything that I try and do. So. We it's, need to get you riled up then because I feel like you're taking today's game quite relaxed. I've and just come off holiday. What do yeah, you expect? Well, well, let me set the scene then. Today you're taking on Rick Shields around the Duke's course. Am I right? Yeah. He starts 10 under par. You start level par. So far in this series, you've played against Tommy Fleetwood and the result was? Well, we don't have to go through everyone. So far I've played Tommy, Adam Scott, Lee Westwood, um, Ricky Fowler. Yes. And I've not won a single okay. one. So if Rick beats you today, you will be the first one he's beaten. So you can't. Don't, have you that. don't need to stop, po- can. stop, I'm not stop that on my poking watch. his fire. You don't need to stoke Look, the fire. Rick will not beat me today. Perfect. Okay. So I want to hear the post man's here. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, great! Thanks for that, guy. I feel like I feel like. Did we say ten? I think I need twenty shots. Um, you know, what, one of the things I did want to very quickly touch on: where, where did your passion for fashion come in? That's sounding quite good. When, passion where, for fashion. Yeah, where did where did that kick in? Because obviously, passion. one of one of if, if someone said describe being Poulter, even now, you get checkered pants, crazy outfits. That's an iconic the image for you. Isn't it? Where did that all yeah. come from? Was that, is that from a young well, age? I, wor- I worked on a market stall as a kid from the age of 11. So working within hmm, sh- selling really dodgy, bright, colourful shell suits. Um, and did you, have to, sell- did you have to wear them? Selling, uh, no, I didn't know because they were minging. <laughs> but um, selling three, three T-shirts for a tenner, um, you know, merchandising all the stock in order of sizes, you know, small to extra large and... Um, Loving how Seve presented himself on the golf course, Payne Stewart, yep. Jasper Parnovic. You can go through the players, you know, of, of old that you would have kind of, you know, recognised um, or followed as a kid um, and say they all looked good on the golf course. They were all their own individual personalities and they all, within their own right, dressed, dressed pretty cool. Mm. So, I, you know, that, I mean, you know, the first couple of years on tour, I, I probably wasn't, I didn't feel comfortable enough really expressing myself in, in the way I, in the way I would love to, A, from a financial standpoint, B, from a standpoint of, of being able to feel confident enough to. Well, well, in a weird way, do you put a target on your back? If you rocked up your first season, rocking the checked pants, rocking the outlandish outfits, you'd kind of put a bit of a target on your back there, wouldn't you? A thousand percent. I think we've got got a delivery for you, Ian. Oh, chef. <laughs> chef. So this is, uh, yes, chef. I feel like organize. he, I feel like he wants, he wanted to, uh, Paul's not shaking my hand. You, He's you've, like, you've had, no. you've, you've had one of the, <laughs> 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 you know, that's the that tightest great. grip. Right. Okay. So well, for it, those listening, it, it is lunchtime as well. Great timing, by the way. I mean, you only make 800 of these a week, right? About that, maybe a thousand. A thousand, thousand sausages. Sausages. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise how, 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 yeah. realize how, uh, how beefy the chef was. <laughs> <laughs> you know the best part? I mean, look, these woven sausage rolls, not only do they smell unbelievable, you won an award yeah, yeah. last week. Did you ever won an award? Wow. Won an award. 
Best sausage rolls. <laughs> so, uh, for everyone <laughs> listening at home, <laughs> Rick, Paul's just brought in some sausage rolls. <laughs> Why is that, Ian? Is that a wall? What have you put in it? <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us some context to, to why there's some sausage rolls in here? Right, so... For people listening at home, there's 10 sausage rolls on the table. A few weeks ago... Hang on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Ian's go. digging in. Oh, no, do it properly. Give us a bit of description. Tell, Tell us first right. why, though, why we're yeah, doing let me this, hold, I'll hold your mic. So, um... What, what, like, you tell me what you think about look, the sausage rolls look, so look, far. Wo- Woburn is pretty famous for the sausage rolls. Joshua absolutely devours them. He has, look, he's actually dying over there come for on, one right on, now. Come, but, one. come and get one, Josh. Um... <laughs> they're famous. They're famous for putting weight on, like I proved last summer, going home 206 pounds. But um, there is a process to how they make these and the caramelized onions that are kind of um, left to simmer for, I think it's 24 hours as they're kind of, they're kind of, um, kind of, they're just kind of caramelizing, marinating, right? <laughs> and um, there's a whole process. They lightly cook them first and then they like, they are absolutely amazing. So uh, apparently, you had one and you bagged it. You, I, I you, sure did. Because you know what? Truth be told, and I want to. I want to cut back to the video. Yeah. They did not look like that. Okay. It's hard to say. That's the worst sausage roll I've had. <laughs> That's the worst sausage roll I've had. <laughs> Size, <laughs> color, taste, heat is. Nah. Is it gonna get finished? No. What an ending. Just walk off. Just is, that, leave. is that the end of that might be the end of sausage roll reviews? God. Thought. I don't even say. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so, so halfway round, we played on the Marquis course a few weeks ago. <laughs> we went to the halfway house. Yeah. Listen, Ian, I was bloody excited about this sausage roll. Yeah. I've had Woburn sausage rolls in the past <laughs> and I've not been disappointed, okay? I turn up, I order a sausage roll, okay? It comes. It does not look like those sausage rolls. It was pale in existence. Now that Don't. does look like a sausage roll. That is a sausage roll. Right, I think you need to retry one, Rick. Okay, and... go on then, Ian. Tell me, describe it for... Oh, oh just in. straight in. Got that oh, sound in there. I'm in. Hot. <laughs> That's why he said it's for me that one. That one's just come straight out the oven. That is hot. Um, <clears throat> give us a rating. Um. <laughs> oh. Ian can't play this afternoon. He's got tongue burn. <laughs> I wait for mine crunchy to cool down. On the outside. Yeah. And the paste is crispy, crunchy on the outside. The sausage is nice and moist and hot. And Can then you, you taste get, the onions. You get the little onion yeah, kicked at the, the bottom. Okay. I mean, it's absolutely magnificent. It's magnificent. On, What's funny, there's someone one. driving the car right now who's listening to this podcast thinking <clears> they're <throat> going to hear Ian Paul talk about his PGA Tour life, winning on tour. They're actually hearing him devour and sausage rolls. And his, uh, his new future in live, and, and they were smashing a sausage roll. Um, it does look a better colour than when I last reviewed it. Very hot, by my um, it, I like the I like the little kind of sesame seeds on top. Yeah. Um, so, generally... I'd like them bigger. Yeah, you've said that okay. before. But <laughs> <laughs> if it does its job, then Not it's the perfect size. size. I would like it a little bit bigger. Yeah. But in would. general, it does look, look quite good. Smell? It does smell good. This isn't the same sausage roll I had. This Just is much, much defeat, better. Rick. No. Careful, it's hot. Some water if you need it. Better? So this is quite dead space now if you're listening. Outrageously better. Oh. It was. Going up. That isn't what? the same sausage roll <laughs> I have. That, that, is out, that is outrageously better. What I'm going to give that, that a solid. Go nine. Come on, be generous. No. What the, it's what in the eight. Great, so eight it's, point it's, five. it's an 8.8. 8.8. 8.8. 8.8. Okay, 8. very good. Josh, so, yeah. you're saying, do you go for 10? Chef will be absolutely <laughs> delighted with that. Yeah. I did, that is a definitely better. I, I'm, you know, I'm really glad. The, that, my, that my notes were taken on board. Yeah. No, no I mean, listen, if... if and Paul's if, come back and smashed it out of the park. I'm going to smash you out of the park in a minute, mate. <laughs> and we'll get an award made up for him. 
I'm sorry, Paul. I'm really, yeah, he's waiting sorry, for that sorry, On a serious note, though, with that, um, the facilities here at Woburn, we've been blown away. We were here a couple of weeks ago. We did some filming. Me and Rick played a Texas scramble around the Marquez course. Uh, we've been today to do a bit of tightless testing on the range. What a facility that is, by the way. That Amazing. The range is really pure. good. Yep. Um, and, and the staff all here have, have been great with us as well. So it's a great place. I can kind of see why you, you call it home. But why is it that you do call this place home? Is it somewhere local to you? or It's... It's meant a lot to me through the years. So I obviously worked Leighton Buzzer Golf Club, probably three miles down the road right. from here. And um, early 2000s, uh, when we was in a position to obviously play on tour, come and do some more practice, the range obviously at Leighton Buzzer was too small. Um, I've always kind of been up and around Woburn. We were in a position to, to come and become uh, the touring professional back in the day. And to have three courses that have all meant a lot from tournament golf because they've all obviously been, been a part of tour golf for quite a long period of time. Um, you know, each and every course in, in their own right is different, difficult, tree lined, mm -hmm. Duchess being super tight. Uh, a course that's a bit, bit shorter than the rest. Uh, we're going to go and play the Dukes in a minute, which is probably um, of all three the one that everyone remembers. Yeah, it's really nice course. Yeah, really great golf course. Watching, I mean, I've I've been up here watching Seve and Monty and Faldo and Woozy and some great yeah, winners here. Amazing winners, amazing. Um, and obviously, you've got the 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 modern of the three. You know, um, on the Marquis course, course that Justin beat me on. I finished runner runner up to him in the um, in the British Masters. A, you know, a long time ago. Um, which is longer, a little bit wider, a little bit more friendly mm. off the tee. Is that the one like in 2015? No, it was back in about 2004. Because you, you hosted, didn't you host one about 2015? I did, here? I did. And that was on, that was on the, um, yeah, that was on the Marquis course. Yeah. I yeah. played in the pro. -am. Just a quick one. One thing we didn't finish before the sausage rolls came in was your fashion. So you Sorry. got on, you got on tour. You, yep. you weren't wearing too much flamboyant stuff, understandably. So you're the new guy on tour. Then how did it start to creep in? Uh, I was I was in a position with my clothing where I could design my own kind of trousers mm -hmm. and start looking a little different. I had a sponsorship deal at the time, which um, it was with Adidas and. I wasn't really a massive fan of their trousers, to be honest. So it kind of started from the trousers and it kind of went a bit from there. Um, we started making one-off trousers down in Savile Row, London. Um, was it William Hunt? Was it William Hunt? It, it was back in the day. Yeah. 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 Um, so he started to, to, to make these trousers, which I've still got most of them today in a, in a box, um, which would make some nice curtains for somebody, I'm sure. <laughs> But um, it, it kind of went from there. So the whole tartan theme went on there. I wore the Union Jack in the Open Championship, yeah. which went berserk. Uh, we did Stars and Stripes. I, I mean, I you know we 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 went across the board in terms of covering every form of possible color, pattern, fabric. Nothing was style, off the radar. Top top in pockets, side pockets, double. But I mean, you know, big flare bottoms, yeah. slits in the side. I mean, we tried it all, really. Plus fours at the Open. The Arsenal um, shirt? The Arsenal shirt in 2006, iconic. I think that was. Uh, call that shirt. I like the that The Burgundy. Shirt. I like that one. It was nice change, with the gold yeah. O2 yeah. middle, which apparently. Was that because it was collared you were allowed to wear it? Um, well, I wasn't allowed to wear it. All right, fair I enough. got I got yeah, a slap fine. on the wrist for that. Oh. But I mean, look, today I don't think I would have got a slap on the wrist. No. I think it'll be okay. Apart from that O2 logo was yeah. probably a bit too yeah, bit too big. Yeah. But today you can almost you can almost get away with anything, right? I mean, Tiger wore the mock turtle collar for a long time, which yeah. changed. And you know, Ricky, it's all right for Ricky Fowler to walk around with his shirt untucked and look really cool, but you can't wear a shirt with a collar. I have you to blame, though, Ian, to be honest with you, because about two thousand three, four, five, I was at the peak of my junior days. And I loved how you dressed, but unfortunately I didn't have the uh, ability to go to Savile Row and get trousers. So I had to go to Next and get pinstripe pants yes. and white belts. Yes. I then used to wear my hair and visor like you did. Yes. And I'd spike it up. But then the problem was- We got the old picture of this. Yes. <laughs> oh, I don't need to see the picture. I'd come into the clubhouse then and I would take my visor off, but because the rest of it was gelled, it looked horrendous. The front bit was all flat. The yeah, top, it looks not good, like, is it? I was a skinny, fort, spotty 14-year-old. It wasn't Hat a good head. look, yeah. And then once I actually went to the opening in 05 with my friend Ben, and um, I wore my most elaborate loud stuff 
to try and because you were playing that one um to try and get you to see me oh you didn't do so you have always done well <laughs> with your hair considering you wear visors in like it always looks good what when you, you mean, take I've it still off got it. Yeah, you've got, got more, it. Than, more than i've got don't worry <laughs> as in like when you take it off you always look it always looks good still yeah how do you do um give some I don't top know, tips really I don't know if it does well my, my recede see i've receded quite a lot at an early age so i think it's because my hairline goes back a bit and the visor sits on the front of that it don't <laughs> yeah. it don't quite mess it up or i'm yeah. worried messy enough yeah that when i matter. took it off it didn't make any difference anyway <laughs> um I, I know one of I mean, i'd be interesting to know your take on this when you released your clothing line yep it was really successful it went everywhere it went yep. in loads of different pro shops yeah but from my understanding, that kind of clouded your judgment off the course and affected then your playing ability on the course. Would that be right in saying that? Have, having any form of business is not easy. I think where we were as a business in, you know, my, my vision for the business was um, produce a clothing line for everyone. Let's turn it into a really big business and let's have some fun with it. Um, there was a number of things along the way that we did and we learned very, very valuable, expensive lessons from, mm. um, you know, running before you walk in yeah. is, is one that I would say, you know, we, we went straight in and we ended up doing ladies too quickly. We did juniors too quickly. Uh, the amount of skews that we did across mm. the board in terms of how many different styles and colors per, um, that was a challenge selling into, into pro shops. Yeah. Is a challenge. Of course it is. Um, it's often the way it's presented in stuff. Like, no offense to some, this shop here is a different level, but some of the pro shops around the country don't display product how you'd want it to be displayed. Oh, well, I'm, and also getting, getting the pro to pay on time, which from a cash flow perspective was difficult. So, you know, selling them £3,000 worth of, of gear is one thing, but then giving them 60, 90 day credit and then actually getting paid on, on day 90. So you could again, go and buy your more, you know, your next range of clothes that that's coming out because the factories need to be paid and stuff needs to be designed, manufactured, put on a ship sent across, you know, across the world to get to you. All of that process was an absolute, absolute nightmare. Was it, was it, was it taking lesson. up a lot of your time? It, I mean, I wouldn't say it took up a lot of time. It took up a lot of headspace time. Mm. It, more, more to the point, we had enough staff to be able to cope with all of that, but just, you know, understanding that the boat that's going past, um, yeah, Africa at the time to, to come through, to be able to be in a position to pay the, you know, million dollars of stock that's on that boat to realize that boat's actually on fire to realize that they wouldn't allow that boat to dock because it was on fire to then realize it has to come into a dry dock in London. So therefore, by the time the, the boat then, I mean, I can- Is that actually true? Is that, that all that's 100% true? 100% truth. Oh, yeah. oh my God. We, we, had, we, we had a whole year's collection of clothes where the boat was on fire and it was coming into a dry dock and it couldn't go into a normal dock because it was going to take up too much time to fix the boat. So it went into a dry dock and they took each container off kind of manually with not the right crane system. So it took a month to oh get all gosh. of the containers off one by one instead of- how they do them like really quite quickly today to then the stock was fine, but how many pro shops then when you've had a bad winter and their stocks two months late, where give them an opportunity to cancel the yeah. orders. No, oh, I mean, listen, it's, it's, um, it's a hard business and anyone that thinks that they can get into the clothing business that we thought we could get in and be super successful. Um, it was too much hard work for the actual return that it was given com compared to what you could earn on the golf course. That's the thing. If you go and win a couple of events, that's going to make what they're about making the year. Well, then I mean, you win we, almost straight after kind of shutting the business down. Didn't you end up doing really well at the players? Well, we, we decluttered a lot of things going in, in and around, not just obviously the clothing line, but, um, you know, taking things back to how they were originally managed in day one. Um, mistakes were being made. Um, from from another agency that were helping out, which uh, caused a lot of stress, financial stress, and mistakes being made, and just just you know too much was going on at the time, and too many things were going wrong, and you know building houses and houses that you had to move out of because 
Um, <laughs> I mean, you turn into a, sob, a, re- sob a, re- story a reset here, button. There, look, a, a few things had to change. We changed them. We simplified the whole process of of what it was we were doing, and and it 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 made a massive difference. Yeah. I want to get into golf now a bit more. We've, I feel like we've dived loads into <laughs> you as you as an individual, which people listening and watching will be absolutely loving all of this. What's the best shot you've hit in your career? What's the, the have you got a number one best shot you've hit? Um, there, there'll be a few that come to mind, but probably the most valuable shot I ever hit was um, at Pals in Spain. It was in in trying to get through to final stage of qualifying. And what year was this? 1998. Okay. Um, 18th hole, par five, uh, trees at about, I don't know, 370 yards off the tee in the middle of the fairway, that overhang, it drives off the tee. I pushed it right in the trees. I had to make par basically to, to, I knew I had to make par to get through. And, um, Hit it right in the trees. I had to chip it back out in the fairway because, I, I mean, around there, it's, you know, it's the old kind of Spanish tree line courses. Mm. It was like here really where you can't really advance it too far. And I had about 230 yards to go, but the trees were kind of, you know, they were in my way now. So I had to flight it perfectly high enough to get over these trees. Um, and I, I remember hitting this two iron absolute, you know, absolutely flush to about 25 feet but you know so many things could have gone wrong at that time mm. and my career might have been in a very different place oh my had, god had this two iron. i mean tour school is probably the most stressful stressful week of your life we covered it a number of years ago in spain at lumina i think it's changed name now but um y- yeah there, there was a lot of stressful golfers there trying to qualify um, it, how crazy is that though in all of that time frame one of your most memorable shots or the best shots was 25 years ago but it but it that was what was the stepping stone to put me on my journey to mm. to, to play golf i mean you know if 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 i don't if that two iron just clips the tree if you know yeah. so many ifs in that scenario which sets you back another year and then you know what other setbacks could have happened at the time and you know you you just never know so i think you know it's easy to turn around and say, oh, hole in a putt yeah. here, right? Which everyone remembers, but it, it's, it's sometimes the, the shot that no one ever saw that you hit that meant so much in the bigger picture of what, what it was I to make. I think that's it, though, because if you think about it, and that's all twofold, not only has that shot literally got you into the next stage of final qualifying, but you've now got that shot in your locker as such in the positive memory that you knew when the pressure was really on, you've hit that golf shot and you pulled it off and got through that moment, if you like. So, you know, moving forward in your career now, when the pressure's on, you, you've done it before and you can do it. And that must be super important as well and help you. I, I, call, I almost call it like an archive. Mm. So with how you've described it is exactly how I would, would memorize every shot I've ever hit. Now, obviously, I can't remember every single shot I've ever hit. But you either do remember the really good shots or you do, re- unfortunately, remember the really bad shots. Mm. All of which I would turn around and put them in a filing cabinet. Yeah. And if you ever have to pull on them, it's good to go into the top drawer mm. <laughs> rather than the bottom drawer yeah. and say, right, well, I, I, know I've hit the, I know I've hit this one before because I've hit it a number of times, but these are the great. So like, you fill yourself full of positive energy and positive thoughts going into playing a really stressful shot or a really hard shot because you know, you've got 1.4, 1.5 seconds really to be able to, to do what you need to do to produce that shot. So you better have the pre-thought mentality that you're capable of pulling that shot off. Um, and hopefully you pull the one out the top drawer and not, and, and not the bottom drawer. I suppose. Yeah. I mean, it makes so much sense. Do you, and again, great for our listeners and viewers. Do you do anything post round? Do you have like a little book? Do you write good shots down? Do you, do you verbalize it? Is there anything that you do that helps file those good shots? Well, James, my agent, team principal, friend, confident, everything who's sitting in the room would, would have an archive because he writes everything down um, <laughs> and notarizes everything. But, you know, I, I don't generally write stuff down. I perhaps should have wrote a lot of things down, 
but that's where I pull it from memory Yeah. in terms of um, what it is I do. In terms of what I do pull from, from archiving stuff and is video content. So video, in, you know, quite important for me to video my swing every single week that I play. So if ever there's a, a week or a tournament that I'm going to and there's a certain feeling or there's a shot shape that I'm hitting currently now, but I want to kind of blend back to how I was playing on a certain given week, like the Players' Championship when I uh, when I finished runner-up. You know, that, that shot from the trees was absolutely ridiculous. 116 yards. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. It was, um, yes, it was, it, was a, it was a little silly, very silly. Um, the shot that got me in there was a bottom draw shot. Well, yeah, that was a, that was a to Tommy Tank, in. and then you, then you followed it up with <laughs> that. Right. I mean, that was ridiculous. So you nearly hold it. You know, I mean, how it didn't go in. There was a little win, there was a little V window split in the tree. So, um, you know, albeit I was covered in beer because I was, I was, um, I was so far right and so far near the hospitality area that everyone was drinking lots. And I remember walking up to the shot, and this woman turned around and backed into me and. No, hoofed a load of beer on me, and then she's like, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I hate him." <laughs> <laughs> so that gave you the confidence you needed. So I was like, "Maybe, maybe you thanks. got, maybe you got a bit of that beer in in you. Maybe that just gave you a little bit of confidence." I'll show I, I think it was more to the point of right. I'm gonna st stuff this in there. And how, yeah. how you hit that shot after a shank uh, is beyond me. Oh, it's I've ridiculous. Done it like you. Shanks are part and parcel of my career. I can mm. name them fourth hole at the, the Masters when Fanny was caddying for me, when my caddy at the time was having a baby. And I had two on that day. I had it on the, on the fourth hole, straight right, lost ball, just read T. Had it on the 15th that week um, and ended up missing the fairway left on 17 from the middle of the fairway on 15. So you did compensate that time. It was it was a proper shank. Over oh, the sorry, trees. you hit one that went over to it the right. Went sorry, over yeah. the trees and went up over. Oh, my days. Um, and I nearly hold out from from there. I've had one on seven. I've had one on ten. I've well, I mean, so I'm to go back to your point, you're almost drawing down on that confidence that after you hit a shank. The chances are you're probably going to hit a pretty special one here's, here's, coming straight here's back. Here's my philosophy on, on a shank. People are bothered with what everyone else is thinking mm -hmm. because you've had a shank. I couldn't give a rat's <laughs> a, about what anyone else thinks. Everyone else has had a shank. Everyone in the mm. world has had a shank. Oh, yeah. I don't care about having a shank. It doesn't matter. Just... Let's get on with the game of golf. Like, let's let me recover from mm. wherever this ball's ended up. It's a good mindset. And crack on. It, like, look, it's you're swinging a golf club at 100 mile an hour and you've got a three or four inch face to hit it on, right? I mean, I hit them out the toe, I hit them a bit low on the face, hit them a bit high, and occasionally yep. we, hit, we hit one out the hill. It, you know, hopefully you don't have two million a year and hopefully you don't have that many in a really important yes. moment is the bit where it gets difficult. <laughs> yeah. like, being, like the 18th. Like the, 18th. <laughs> at the, at the players. <laughs> One of the questions I had for, for, for you then, Ian, is that obviously um, you're a live player and last year I went to Live London for the first event, see what yeah. it was like, and I came back and said, there was the parts of it that I kind of really enjoyed. We said on the podcast a number of weeks ago that Rick was going to come to London for his first live event. Are you still keen, Rick? Yeah, I am. We've got tickets through today. I want you to explain to Rick what you think he will feel on site and how it's different to maybe a normal kind of DP World Tour event. Sure. I, A, first and foremost, I can't wait for you to come. Hopefully you're going to have your Majestics hat on and not a Four Aces hat. <laughs> Or fireballs hat. Um, who, who's, you'll your, get, who's, who's your oh, big? Oh, goodies oh, already. Oh, oh, oh. Who, who's your, Listen, who's your, as as you like free gear. Now you can give it away if you like. But I mean, it'd be nice to see you wear a nice majestic hat there. Just because I'm under contract, unfortunately, with Lyle Scott, I, I will oh. I will happily give this away. Who, who's your like? Ar so who's your in. arch enemy team at the moment? Have you got like a team? Look, that we, we we are currently not in a position of saying we have an arch enemy team. Because in the table of, let's call it the Premiership, right? We're kind, of, we're kind of low down, and we obviously want to move up. So I wouldn't really say we've got an arch enemy. We we would like to be in the top spot. Yeah, there is enormous value in being in the top three. 
And that is what we set out to achieve at the start of the year. We're not doing what we think we are capable mm-hmm. of doing. So we need to move up. So going back to Guy's point there, I'm, I'm live yep. London this yep. year. From what I've seen on YouTube and, and et cetera, it's, it appears like a very different type of crowd yep. that are going to live. Is that, would that be fair yeah, to I, say? I, I would say your demographic is a little younger, which is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll hear music on the golf course, which I think all of us play golf generally casually with some form of music playing. A lot of people travel with a little speaker in the bag, so we got music in the in, in a golf car. It's certainly popular in America, isn't it? Very popular. Um, that you'll see on the golf course, that I think is a really cool, relax, relax vibe. Um, you have the ability to watch, I think, because there's only 48 players instead of, you know, two waves of, say, 78 players playing, you can reverse walk around the golf course and see every single player in the entire field in a short space of time that you don't have the beauty in an, any normal regular tournament because they're kind of spaced out either morning or afternoon draw. And that kind of takes up the entire day. Great hospitality, in various areas around the golf course. Again, good food. Mm-hmm. You can have a drink. Um, it's a bit more, you know, like a family orientated type venue situation again because 48 players in and around the driving range everyone's on the range at exactly the same time yeah because it's a shotgun start so there are so many cool things that make it and distinguish it as being different um two tournaments in one tournament yeah the fact of the leaderboard being able to to not only show you you know an individual an individual leaderboard but you've obviously got the team aspect if you're a you know a team follower yeah. Where you want to see, you know, your team move up during the week. So there, there, there are so many cool things I think within, you know, Live Golf's concept that that works so well, not just for us as players, but obviously for the fan following as well. Well, that was one thing, and we had a little brief chat before the podcast started. It's been no secret that we've had very mixed opinions on Live. We've liked some things, we've not liked some things, and, and that's something we kind of stand by. But when I came back from the Live London event, and I think I said this on the podcast many times, there was lots I was impressed by. Firstly, the kind of tented village area, the food was great. It was a good atmosphere. It was a different demographic, like you said. It was kind of golfy, but not too golfy, if that makes sense. And one thing that st- stood out to me massively, whether it be the same this year or not, I, I don't know. But how actually close you could get to the players? Like obviously, you were there. Phil Mickelson was there. DJ, these huge, huge names, and it did feel quite kind of personal. So, if you are a fan of golf and you want to see these guys up close and personal, there's not many better places I would, I would say than than the live events. To be fair, yep, I agree. Look, it's 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 a it's a great viewing event to be able to go to concerts after the round of golf as well. Yeah. So, you know, you don't, you don't have to be a mega golfy fan, fan, fan mm-hmm. to realize that there's a great name playing in the concert. So as soon as the round of golf finishes, you can walk straight to the stage area and obviously, you know, hang out, have a beer and, you know, enjoy a great concert, which we've done at various times as well in, in Adelaide, Fisher was playing. And, um, and then you do a shoey. Did you do a shoey? I ended up doing a shoey, yeah, <laughs> uh, which was disgusting. I, 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 I never it. quite understood that concept. Nor have I. <laughs> I I think think that's shoe. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't even I, drink out my own shoe. I hate feet as well. <laughs> I have a really big problem with feet, and especially someone else's smelly feet. So you, you must have had a few already before you did that. Well, I had a couple. I had a couple, so it probably made it a bit <laughs> easier to do, yeah. <laughs> what have you what have you as a player enjoyed most about joining Liv? There's there's so much, there are so many positives in, 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 in how I view live as to what it's given me the opportunity to do. It's given me a lot of more family time. Um, a lot of people are going to take this back and, you know, oh, you, you're just making lots more money. That is one aspect of obviously the, the original attraction is we're playing for a lot of money per week. So let's, let's get that one and let's, let's, yeah. let's cover that one straight away. Yes, we're paid. Even if you don't play very well and you finish last, you're still going to get paid. I think people respect you saying that, though. Do, do you if feel you like s- a few too many players maybe didn't, weren't as open about that when, when, it, when they I first think signed? I think that's the case. Look, for sure, it, 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 was, it was a big piece of it, right? People only turned around and said it was money, money, money situation. Look, that is one part of the situation. But, but, but after experiencing live for 18 months in this position that we're in, and we understood the business model as it was, 
coming into Live that to own a piece of a franchise excites me as a business owner anyway, and yeah. someone that's had a real interest, you know, not just within golf, but outside in other aspects of business. To be able to try and grow a franchise business, to be able to be part of a team, to be able to travel with a team, to be, to be able to spend time not just with teammates, but the people in and around the team that run the team, um, to work with some of the best trainers, physios, to help you get prepared in a way where you haven't done it as good as you possibly could have done, to tee off at the same time, knowing your tee time before you start the week means you can plan your whole week, to bring on a new kind of a different audience of sponsors and a different group of sponsors and corporate people that you can finally entertain them in a way where you've never been able to entertain them ever before a PJ tour event or a European tour event or any tour event. Normally you don't ever really get any <clears throat> sponsorship time where we can control our sponsors and we can control their guests in a way where we can give them the most incredible golf experience that they're probably ever going to have at any golf event, because that's part of team majestic's ability to, to, to give that level of experience. And that's what people want nowadays. So, um, you know, booking your travel months and months and months in advance, knowing when you can book a return flight because you know, your tee off time on a Sunday, it, it's little things mm. like that, which sound kind of silly in a way when you say it, but you know, but after any, spending 25 years not doing that. Well, you don't know when your tea time is. Yeah. You don't know what flight you can catch. You don't know, you know, in and around where you're going to be able to book a dinner table. You don't know what time you, so this, I mean, there's, you know, there are so many little pieces of the puzzle of what goes into a normal week. Um, how you're going to, you know, how you're properly going to prepare because of that. Obviously we don't have that early tea time anymore yeah. on a Thursday, Friday. Which is, which is a huge deal in terms of rest and recovery. And do you feel like, therefore, when players are out on the golf course all at the same time, there's, there's no huge advantage? Like, as in, what Zero I mean, advantage. You, you know, you yeah. don't get an early mm. tee off and suddenly the wind the was quieter course. or whatever. Yeah. Yep. It, it wouldn't be fair if I didn't ask, what are you missing and what do you not enjoy as much? What am I missing? Um, oh, friends. Mm. Obviously, friends that you've spent. 20 years, some of which 25 years of your life with week in, week out. Um, you know, that would be a part of, of, of live, which only having 48 players, you can't have 150 players. So therefore you're going to miss some people, but I don't miss 155, <laughs> but you're going you're to miss a few. Um, so to be able to have that, you know, and, and, continue those relationships away from the golf course. Sometimes it's always been difficult anyway, because they have a life, I have a life, um, and you don't really s see them week in, week out. So um, I miss that, that aspect. Um, it's, it's probably, to be honest, it's probably just that. Mm. You know, the staff, some of the staff, referees, people that you've had relationships with for a very long time, um, that you know, you just miss saying hello to. So. Kind of sounds like leaving a job in a way, like leaving from one business to go to another business. It might be more money, it might be better flexibility, it might be more working from home, or whatever it might be. If you see that's a better opportunity for you, it is. But equally, you might then miss someone that you should go and see every day that you'd walk in who's a receptionist or whatever like yeah, that. Um, but but you know the 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 bigger picture of this was always going to be, you know, we we knew we were playing for fourteen weeks a year because that's what we sign up to play for. Um, but the European tour allowed a minimum of, you had to play a minimum of four events. So there was always, there was always the ability to play European tour events as well as playing live events. That was obviously going to be difficult to do that on the PGA tour because the minimum is 15. Mm. So you wasn't going to then go and play 29 events mm. plus the majors could, could be 33. That's too many. So, um, you know, we didn't know at the time that by playing live, it was going to be, you know, heavily, heavily frowned upon in a way where therefore, you know, you were going to get penalized and punished and suspended and, and all of that stuff. Um, but, 
you know, that, that was the unknown. Mm, yeah. we'd, we'd asked questions and, you know, what if we take the opportunity to play, you know, the, the answer was never given what was going to, what, what was going to happen. So, um, the hope was Liv was going to be accepted into the, into the, the picture of golf, um, that there would be an agreement in place, which obviously is going to be, is going to be talked about over the coming months to see how exactly that's going to work out now. So, um, very thankful in a way that mm. it's come to that position where the guys have, you know, clearly the smart business people have got together and kind of seen that, you know, live should stay, live can stay. And there is a coming together under an umbrella agreement, which is going to be worked out. It's going to say, how, how do you feel like the future of that is that the future of golf in general and professional golf is going to look over the next few years? We don't know. I mean, obviously that's, that's all to be discussed, I think in the coming months. So, um, being part of live and being part of, you know, a golf fan as such, it's exciting. I think from, from my perspective that there is an acceptance out there. There is an acceptance that, you know, live is a good product that we can give something out to the golf fan, which is, which is good. It's going to be accepted. And how does that look in 12 months? I don't know. Like I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, potentially that, that where, where they get to with the agreement and how they're going to place the tournaments in the places where they should be. And, you know, we can, we can hopefully get, you know, get more and more fans involved in the game of golf to give over several different forms of product with DP world and PGA tour and, and live golf. So it's, um, it's kind of uh, let's 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 see how the next three months pans out. It does certainly seem like there's a there's a huge turning of the tides. Just the last few weeks, it feels like conversations are starting to take place. Obviously, the US Open last week, and the way that players are even being with each other, it fe- it feels like the friction is being softened. That's what it feels like from the outside. I'm not sure if you can talk about that from the inside. Whether you've experienced any of that. But also I wonder what what that's going to look like, let's say over the next few years, like how I'm just so intrigued to know. And I'm sure as a fan, but as a player, as players, you're all a bit like, God, how does this all pan out for me? What's my future going to look like? For example, like, is there going to be a future where live players can now start to be accepted back into Ryder Cup from a European side of things, you know, hopefully. Because I'm guessing that must be a huge life goal for yourself to be Ian Poulter, Ryder Cup captain. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, you know, you can't play eight Ryder Cups and not want to be part of a Ryder Cup. So, you know, when, by the way, not only play eight Ryder Cups to be a frigging legend, legend on the European team, like you're the most decorated, uh, aren't you the most decorated individual points well, Sergio's won the most points. But in, is um, it not individual matches? Aren't you the number one? Well, I've never lost a singles match. I don't think, I don't think Monty's lost one either. I mean, that's pretty ridiculous. I mean, I want to dive into this a little bit more, but like your Ryder Cup history is incredible. And I think that would also be what's transcended you into a household name. Like, I think a lot of non-golfers clearly know who Ian Poulter is. And I think that comes from 100%. that kind of Ryder Cup legacy. Yeah, it, it, it's been a big part of my 25 years on tour. I think when I, you know, when I look back at my first one, 2004, um, and all of the, all of the ones that I've subsequently played and, you know, Medina being notable for. Medina was ridiculous. (laughs) You know, notice of all for, you know, the, the, the Saturday afternoon comeback and Sunday, um, you know, even, you know, being picked and being under the scrutiny because Faldo picked me and, you know, winning four and a half points in, in, in that Ryder Cup and um, Paris beating Dustin Johnson, world number one in singles, who just wouldn't, he just wouldn't roll over, kept holding 50 footer on 70 footer on 40 footer. And um, yeah, I mean, Ryder Cup has been a huge part of my, my, you know, my tour career, I think today, I think, um, people still want to talk about that today. I did, I did a, I did a, um, 
a luncheon yesterday afternoon and, and Ryder Cup was a big topic, mm-hmm. uh, which come up and Medina come up again. So, I mean, you know, that was 11 years. That was 11 years ago and, and it's still it's still a huge topic. So, look, I think I think for me, we can talk about Ryder Cup for hours, right? I, I can bore all, all of the list, listeners um, on Ryder Cup, but, you know, the hope in all of this, I think, uh, the coming together, the the, the merge of, of of how that agreement's going to play out is exciting from a Ryder Cup standpoint. Yes. Hopefully, um, it makes sense. And again, I don't know the details of how exactly this is going to pan out. And mm-hmm. of well, course, you know, but, but that that's a dream of yours for that to to I, happen. If I ever get in a position and and things smooth themselves out in in enough to be able to help out in a Ryder Cup, let's say, from a from an experience standpoint, from a standpoint of being able to be in that position for the fans as well, for for what you've been able to help out, um, would be a, an absolute dream of mine. I think three weeks ago, I would have said that was never a possibility. I think since the conversation of merger, it was it was almost the first thing that came to my mind. Does this mean hopefully touch wood you know water can go on the bridge and then there might be a possibility of having Ian Poulter as a Ryder Cup captain Lee West was a Ryder Cup captain Sergio Garcia as a Ryder Cup captain Henry Stenson again Ryder Cup captain that has to happen Graham McDowell Ryder Cup captain Martin Keimer like the list Mm, of captains and vice captains etc of of all the experience of everything that all of you have done for the Ryder Cup in excelling it to the level it's at now there has to be a future, please. That we're, I know it's oh. not on you. I know it's not on you. <laughs> and I'm not saying on you, but if you could do it, hard, no. but like, and I, and I know that the, I'm sure the comments, yeah, but the guys knew that when they were going to, but also you might not, you might not have known To be honest, it. we didn't know no. because we asked the question numerous times. Um, you know, we don't have to go into the detail of that, but we, you know, we asked if, if we were going to, you know, look at, Playing fourteen live events a year, what what would that mean? And there 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 you know there was no there was no answer. So there was no this is this is how things are going to lay themselves yeah. out. So you know it's it, it's it's very hard. It's very difficult to to make a decision, make decisions without knowing all of the detail at play. So you know you can only de- deal with the detail in front of you, and and that's obviously what we did. And you know the hope moving forward is that the powers that be in the game of golf and the smart business people that, that help and advise with inside this great game of golf are, are now sitting around the same table, which is good. It's kind of a shame it's taken as long as it took to get to this position. Um, but I think as, as, a, as, a, as a player, as a golf fan, I think it's exciting that, you know, they are sitting around the table. They can have a... Uh, sensible level he- level headed conversation today, and hopefully set aside obviously the emotions at play, and do the right thing for the business side of the game of golf for the fans at mind. Last thing, I've got to blame you for something. Yep, back what is in it? my da- my diner, I Ooh. got kicked out of a sports bar because of you. <laughs> did you? Yeah, good on you. So stop. Sourced up, yeah. watching Medina. Did you ever? Did you ever rare up with a with an American fan? No, it's worse than that. Go on. I got kicked out of this golf simulator bar, sports bar, watching the Ryder Cup because when, and whether it was when you held a putt or I think it was when you held a putt or someone held a putt against you, I think it was. Who did you play in singles at Medina again? Uh, Webb Simpson. He, he held a putt against you on the back nine, and I I picked up a Scotch egg. <laughs> That was on the table in and Medina. I, no, I was in this golf simulator bar in ah, Manchester. In oh, I picked up this, this Scotch egg and I threw it at the screen at Webb Simpson. It was in so much anger that Did I got kicked him? out. I think I missed. But I, <laughs> I might have hit you. I got kicked out of this sports bar, and the very next day, because it was a friend of mine, I had to go around and as an apology, I took a little box of Scotch eggs around and oh, apologised. Scot- as the apology, I just thought it'd be quite ironic. Okay, salt in the wound. <laughs> but anyway, uh, well, that's a great note to end on. Thank um, you, Ian. We're yeah, going to get out and play insane. some golf. Um, really enjoyed that. Anything? Anything else you want to cover? Anything else you want to get off your chest? 
<laughs> Can't be no, right. I mean, jest. listen, we, look, that, that's been an hour, that's an hour and a half, and we could probably do this for about four hours. So we'll let's do it do, again. We'll, let's do a part two. Let's oh. do it again. Let's do it in Orlando. Oh, wow. Done. Late we'll do, no, no. We'll do it in the museum. Okay. With all the rider cars. I must admit, it's, can, it's, can I come to that I'm one? Not, I'm no. not even. Yeah, yeah, of course you can. Please, Ian. <laughs> <I'm> not, <laughs> if I lose today, I'll let you drive one of the Ferraris. I, I'm right, not okay, even. <laughs> We're going. <laughs> I, I, had, I had about all the car collection on my list and I, and I didn't even get into that because that's you, another part crazy two. world. Keep people waiting for part two. Ian, thanks for your time. Thanks to Woburn. Thanks to Paul the Chef for this 8.8 sausage I want roll. I apologise now and say that you really like him. I'll apologise to the chef who cooked the original one. Can you just say now? Well, no, I'm not going to apologise to him. I'm going to apologise to... Paul, Rick Shields because he wasn't the Wolburn chef. Sausage rolls, just have a little sound bite. Hi, I'm Rick Shields, and I recommend Woburn sausage rolls. Perfect. Right, guys, thanks for watching, listening. Make sure you follow Ian on, on all the socials. I'm 6. sure you do. Six point one million. Six point one million views we want on this match, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Peace.